All right, I'm back now. We gave you an introduction, but really I think about it as probably more like a part one because it was like 45 minute video. So we could call that a part one. So sometimes you make shit up as you go along, you know what we do. All right, so that'll be part one. This will be part two of sickle cell. Okay, now I promised you something and of course <laughs> I broke my promise. So let me help you out. Last time I talked to you in part one that I was going to give you the holy hookup on how to get the handy dandy little study guide and any other resources you need. Now the study guide is called the oh my god packet and I give that freely to you and it has all kinds of shit in it. It's got an NCLEX quickie, it's got the NGN case study type of format, it's got the um, the select dolls for all your shocks, it's got your bleeding precautions, neutropenic precautions, your um, who knows, uh, dysphagia. It's got everything in there. It's got infectious diseases. It's got maternity quickies. It's even got cultures, diets, and positions. It's a lot of shit in there that I know you can use and a little bit of pharmacology because you know there's more pharmacology and infectious diseases on this new NGN NCLEX. So part two of sickle cell, more like a little bit of continuation of part one. I'm going to just start off giving you my phone number and my email so you can stop whining because I didn't do it in the last video. Okay, so here we go, y'all. Call me. Don't call me. I ain't going to answer. Text me. Let's put it that way. Okay. 216-410-0936. Now, Everybody know that damn number. This has been my same damn number for 30, 40 years, okay? I don't change my phone number like some of y'all change our panties. A lot of y'all got a new phone number every other month with a new man. No, I'm stable, okay? I'm, I'm old as hell and I'm stable. That's been the same number since Christ left Jerusalem. You got that? Now, let's do the email. Shelly's and Plex Prep at gmail.com. You, you're working with me, right? I just, I need you to stay with your girl. All right, so that's out the way. You can't whine anymore. I hope you got your little colored pens and your little highlighters ready because I'm trying to teach you something. Now, in the first video, we talked about how every video I'm doing this year, next year, whatever, how many years I do this, I am using the new NGN next generation NCLEX format. In other words, I'm making sure that you know that every lecture has a basis called clinical judgment. In the first video on sickle cell, which was a big video, I introduced the concepts of sickle cell so that you were able to recognize the cues and analyze the cues. Well, now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into recognition and analysis of the cues by going over the signs and symptoms of sickle cell. Now, when we started off, we already told you it was genetic. Both parents had to have the trait. I left this up here because it means something. Autosomal recessive, both parents have the trait. And the signs and symptoms of sickle cell crisis is very important for you to know that this poor patient could suffer with a crisis as much as every single week or as little as once a year. So it just depends. Every person is different and every person has a um, management plan that's different, especially if they have a piece of shit healthcare, you feeling me? Or no insurance or something crazy like that. So stay with your girl. Last video, I talked about all the triggers. So when you're looking at recognition of cues and analysis of cues, look in the case study on NCLEX for one of these triggers. In my situation, my student had got off the plane and had a crisis. Um, another student of mine, her daughter had fell on the ice waiting for the bus. That was the trigger. I had another uh, uh, student who had a child with the flu caught a fever slash infection. That was her five-year-old's trigger, okay? Uh, somebody else had a crisis during surgery. Loss of blood is loss of a red blood cell, is loss of a hemoglobin, loss of the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin, boom, hypoxia. I've had people who were nausea, vomiting, 
diarrhea, leading to di dehydration, have a crisis. These are all triggers. So what does a crisis feel like? Well, here we go. You got to know the $4 words. You know there's $4 words with all these disease processes. And so I did include some of that for you. If you look at the word hypoxia, decreased oxygen, right? Low oxygen. You know that a low oxygen in the blood is going to lead to ischemia, which is lack of oxygen to the tissues that the blood was supposed to supply. If you use another word and you think about low oxygen in the blood leading to low oxygen in the tissues, you could say that this patient has a decreased perfusion of what? Their organs, okay? So low oxygen in the blood because a significant amount of the red blood cells in the blood vessel are sickled and they do not live long, 20 days versus 120 days. And you have ischemia, which is decreased oxygen to actual tissues. And of course, tissues make up organs, so you have decreased perfusion to your organs. Now that should make perfect sense. So what is the patient going to feel? I told you the pain was severe. It's so severe that we have, uh, based on research, concluded that the two most painful conditions on earth include what I taught you before, pain creatitis. Notice how I did that? Pancreatitis, pain creatitis. Okay, so pancreatitis, very painful. First nursing action, treat the damn pain. Okay, the second condition known to be more painful than anything else on earth except for pancreatitis is sickle cell crisis. So you're gonna see when we go through our clinical judgment and we look at uh, taking action, you're gonna see that we're going to be treating a lot of pain, okay? It may not be the first nursing action like it was with pancreatitis, but we're gonna be doing a lot. Now, so this pain, where in the hell is it? Oh, this poor patient. Sickled cells are fragile, they're sticky, they clump, they stick together, and they generally will do it around the joints. Well, why? Because think about it. If you have a straight extended extremity, the blood's gonna flow straight through. But once you put a bend in it, now the blood has got a turn and it gets stuck in the turn. So the joints are gonna hurt like hell. Bones and joints hurt like hell. Now, the wonderful thing about the patient with joints and bone pain in this situation is it might help you distinguish this disease from so many others that, are, that present the same way, right? So just remember that when we come talking about prioritize hypothesis. Now the abdomen, oh, the abdomen can hurt for any number of reasons. If you have ischemia and decreased perfusion to the GI system, you could have a mild blockage causing your stomach to hurt because the stomach relies on a very good perfusion or blood flow and oxygen to tissue to do its little peristalsis thing and to keep things moving. But if you do have ischemia, lack of perfusion to the GI system, that could hurt in the form of like just a mild obstruction really. If it's not that and the patient, you ask the patient, because I taught you about man, what to do when it came to abdominal pain. You can't just let somebody come in your uh, hospital and my stomach hurt. I told you what to do. Have the patient point to where it hurts. So let's just say for shits, kicks, and giggles that the patient points over here, it just hurts so bad. Do you remember your glass? Probably not. Let me show you as your glass, shit. Lord, these kids don't remember shit. Here, let's do a miniature glass because you were supposed to notice from way back. Glass is G L A S S. And I told you this was your belly. This right here in the middle was your belly button. I split 
I split the belly up in quadrants, didn't I? Now, I ain't got to have a bikini for you to understand what I'm talking about, do I? I'm going to draw it on my stomach, okay? So, so from the bottom of the sternum all the way through the belly button to the pubic bone. Pubic bone, bottom of the chest or siphoid area. And then we went, belly button as our landmark, from side to side. We split the belly up in fours. We put organs in each side, okay? Now, wait a minute now. I got to make sure you know. This is me facing you. So this is my right upper quadrant. Right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, left upper quadrant quadrant. Now, let's put some organs in this bad boy. Remember the mnemonic of glass. G-L-A-S-S, -S, but I told you to put a little bitty S over here. What were these organs, y'all? Gallbladder, liver. Gallbladder, liver. Where is the gallbladder and the liver? Right upper quadrant. The liver's here, the gallbladder's tucked up underneath there, a little bit behind. A, right lower quadrant, appendix. S. Yeah, I said it's shit. It's shit. Not really, but your ass gonna remember it like that. What is it really? Sigmoid colon. Remember that? Remember that, y'all? Hopefully you remember that shit. Okay, but I say shit because if you're constipated, that's where the hell it's gonna hurt. This big S. Stomach, your stomach is right here, but what's underneath it, but still in the upper quadrant? Spleen. So when your patient says, my stomach hurt, my stomach hurts so bad, they're not lying, that shit hurt real bad. But there's lots of different reasons why it could hurt. Like I said, it could be a little bowel obstruction, a little bit of a, like almost like a paralytic ileus, mild, easy to get going again. But more than likely, it's this little booger right here. Now, I don't know about you, but the spleen does not get the respect it deserves in nursing school. I bet your little ass don't know shit about the spleen, do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Here's the deal. Your spleen is known as the garbage can for dead red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Your spleen being the garbage can for dead red blood cells and these sickle cells dying every 20 days versus every 120 days makes your garbage can fill up. And when your garbage can fill up, you get something called splenomegaly. And now your little spleen is overworked and underpaid and enlarged. The problem is the spleen shares circulation with the liver. So whatever happens over here is supposed to flow down and around up in here. And since this bad boy is overflowing and trying to push everything over here, now you're overloading your liver. So instead of just plain old splenomegaly, We done turned the daggone thing around and got hepato spleno megaly. Oh my God, right? So not only is your stomach hurting because there's ischemia and lack of blood flow, which is going to interrupt normal peristalsis. Your stomach hurts because your spleen is being overworked and underpaid and causing an enlarged spleen that is going through some damage as well as because the spleen set, uh, shares circulation with the liver. Now you're getting the liver all enlarged. So that is a reason why the patient's stomach hurts really, really, really bad, seriously. Okay, so this is one. Another big, huge problem is that 
your patient could be admitted with what's considered the number one cause of death in this sickle cell patient. It used to be that the acute chest syndrome was responsible for 68% of kids dying before age four. This child or adult that gets admitted saying that their chest hurts is your OMG, you better see them first. It is an emergency. And why is it that their chest is hurting? Well, there could be any number of reasons. There is a very high chance that this patient with this chronic disease process already has pulmonary hypertension. The patient could be experiencing a pulmonary embolism or even a fat embolism. The patient could be having a recurrent episode of pneumonia. And any of these things could be true with the patient coming in with chest pain. You would agree the worst one is this chronic pulmonary hypertension. And of course, PE is not far behind it in fat embolism. Okay, so you are on point if a patient comes in some of the chest hurts, that's crazy as hell, okay? Now, when we're looking at recognizing and analyzing cues, if we're smart, we understand that this hypoxia, ischemia, decreased perfusion will cause a $4 word called vaso-occlusive crisis in which the destruction of these red blood cells because they're sickled leads to more sickling as the bone marrow tries to put out more red blood cells. Because when the bone marrow tries to put out more red blood cells to compensate for the lack of oxygen and for the anemia that's going on, you just gonna get some more sickle cells. This hemolytic anemia, don't let that scare you. Heme means blood, lytic means destruction. It's just another way of giving another title to what we said up here and up here. Hemolytic, destruction of blood. This patient is anemic. The funny thing about this, you'll find out later, you can't give them iron. This organ damage is a focus, especially when we're talking about analyzing cues. When the patient comes in and their creatinine is three, why is that significant? Because the patient with sickle cell will have kidney failure over time if they have numerous crises every year. So if you are having a crisis at least once a month or more, every single crisis that you have causes permanent destruction to vascular membranes and organs. It causes damage and scarring to all your organs. Now, which organs are the focus for the scarring and damage and even ultimately disabilities? Kidneys and the heart. You might remember me saying that the kidneys and the heart are married. Whatever happens to the heart happens to the kidneys. Whatever happens to the kidneys happens to the heart. And what will that look like in a patient with sickle cell? That patient can come in with CHF, congestive heart failure. The spleen and the liver are married because they share circulation, hepatosplenomegaly. Normally, you should not be feeling a spleen in a baby. If you feel a spleen in a baby, it's quite enlarged. Remember that I said never deeply palpate a spleen because you could rupture it, okay? The brain. Why does the patient with sickle cell have a, an issue with the brain? Oh, that's easy, because they're at very high risk for a stroke. And you know that's a clot in the brain. What about this retina business, Shelly? Well, yes, these sickle cells can clot, clump, stick, and occlude the retina, which blindness will follow, okay? 
bones and joints. What happens here? Oh, you can have some decreased range of motion and utter lack of mobility. You can have patients who can't walk anymore. Their bones and their joints are necrotic and they hurt. The patient even has a risk as a male, a male child even, four-year-olds with priapism. This is a non-sexually stimulated erection of four hours or more that they can do nothing about and it hurts and can damage their organ for life. This is part of sickle cell. These are children sometimes. Obviously we're monitoring this in adults, but this could be a precious child. Okay, a lot of pain. Vascular, their vascularity in their extremities or the vascular system in their extremities. What does that mean? It means that they can have a deep vein thrombosis, which as you know, 100% of pulmonary embolism started out as a DVT, or they could get really awful leg ulcers and kids get these as well. So what happens if they get these leg ulcers? I wanna show you something. The patient with these leg ulcers, it's usually on the inner um, ankles or the shins. They are very often not simple, well, nothing simple about a leg ulcer, but it's not as easy as you might think. This patient's leg ulcers very often become necrotic. Um, they can require debridement. Um, they can get this patient into nasty, horrifying infections. So it's not just any leg ulcer, it's very severe leg ulcers, unlike anything you can even imagine because they're not getting good blood flow. What did we say? The perfusion has decreased, especially extremities. Now, the spleen. You remember me saying it was the garbage can for dead red blood cells? It's also the vacuum cleaner for the bloodstream. What does that mean? Well, it means that not only does the spleen play a role in um, storing dead red blood cells and filtering it on into the liver so the liver can you know, get rid of it as Billy Rubin or whatever else, this spleen is also part of your immune system. And so when you have a patient whose spleen is being, what did we say? Overworked, underpaid, and your spleen is like taking a hit. It tends to become atrophied and slowly but surely gets destroyed. And so with the spleen that's just like a piece of crap, not really working really well, you're going to be at very great risk for infections. Number one infection that these patients get is recurrent infections of pneumonia, especially as children. This is why flu vaccines every year, pneumonia vaccines every five years are really part of the deal with this patient. Not to mention very often we give these patients like penicillin, like literally penicillin twice a day, every day, just to prevent all this hot mess. They may get a UTI because they're at higher risk for an infection. So if you're looking at this patient and they're coming in after going on a ski trip with their friends and they're known to have sickle cell disease and they come in and it's a female and she's also on um, estrogen containing birth control pills. Uh, she's in college, she's a college age student and she comes in complaining of severe abdominal pain and that her legs hurt, especially her knees and her hips. Uh, she's in tears. Um, you know, your first treat pain medication did not work at all. She needs something stronger. And you get her labs back and you can see that she's anemic, right? So she's gonna show you that her H and H are low, but then every single one of these patients, their white blood cells are high. And so she's kind of presenting like that initially. Um, and so it would not be, uh, oh, I mentioned, I should have mentioned African American or Latino young lady, because we got to recognize all these cues, right? We're, we're talking about ethnicity in the first video. Um, 
We're talking about triggers. Here we have estrogen. Another trigger was high altitudes, going uh, skiing in Colorado. Um, you know, you gotta do this to figure out what does this patient have. Now, hopefully you're ready for the next video because I think I did a fairly decent job for you to be able to recognize and then analyze the cues. So, deuces, I'll see you in a minute, y'all.